My name is Sarah Minirad, and I am the PBRN coordinator with DOTouch.net. Uh, thank you for joining our, our webinar today. So let me go over a few housekeeping rules really quickly. Um, so please add your name and location to the all panelists and attendees so that all participants can see who else is attending the webinar today. If you register for CME, please add your name to the chat so we can verify your attendance so you can receive your CME. Additionally, you will need to complete your physician attestation form, which was emailed to you this morning, and the evaluation survey, which will be emailed to you this afternoon. Our planning committee has no conflicts of interest to disclose. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please send a message to all panelists in the Q&A. And if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please feel free to type them into the Q&A pod. Please also feel free to address each other's questions and comments there as well. After the presentation, we will have time for discussion and questions, and if you would like to speak during the discussion, please raise your hand and we will unmute your microphone. We ask that you briefly introduce yourself. Please feel free to turn on your camera if you would like. When contributing to the discussion, please limit microphone time to three minutes to allow time for everyone who wants to participate in the discussion. We will provide you notifications using flashcards to assist you in keeping track of time. After everyone has had the opportunity to make comments or questions, there may be additional time for further discussion. Please keep in mind that this webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the dotouch.net website where you'll have the opportunity to continue the discussion on a discussion forum. Watch for an email from dotouch.net announcing when the recording and the discussion forum are available. <coughs> All right, please help me welcome Dr. Peter Murray, the Program Director at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, who will be speaking about the NIH strategic plan and its mind and body initiatives. Dr. Murray joined NCCIH in 2019, where he provides stewardship over a portfolio of active grants and administrative supplements spanning a broad range of complementary and integrative intervention research, develops research initiatives to address funding gaps in NCCIH high priority areas and collaborates across NIH institutes and centers on trans NIH programs to communicate NCCIH research priorities. Before this, he was the Pain Management Portfolio Manager at the U.S. Army Medical Research and Development Command with the Clinical and Rehabilitative Medicine Research Program. Dr. Murray received his Bachelor's of Science in Biology and his Ph.D. in Neuroscience from the University of Maryland and presents today with over 20 years of experience in research, medical research, scientific writing, and grant writing. Dr. Murray, I'm going to stop sharing so the floor can be yours. Great, thanks so much. Um, let me get my presentation up here. Okay, are you seeing the presentation? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you all um, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to come and talk to this group um, and share with you some of the things that um, have recently been going on at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, where I am a program officer. Um, we re recently um, revised our five-year strategic plan. Um, so, and we're shifting in a little bit of a different direction, a new and exciting direction. I think that, and I hope that this community um, would agree that this is a good choice um, and it is an exciting new direction for us because I think a lot of our um, priorities in this area do align highly. So with that, oops, um, I have no disclosures to disclose. Um, okay, so first I'm gonna go over um, what we mean by whole person health. Uh, this is a cornerstone of our new um, a concept at NCCIH, uh, and I'll describe what we mean by whole person health. And then I'll talk about how the strategic plan was molded around this concept. <clears throat> our new vision for whole person health was presented for the first time by our director, Dr. Elaine Langevin, to the NCCIH Council in spring of 2020. Since then, we've had a lot of conversations both inside NCCIH and out in the research community. And the response to this theme has been largely enthusiastic. To illustrate our vision, we started the conversation about whole person health by talking about plants. 
And we talked about how like plants, humans also have intermediate stages between health and disease that can be reversible. And that the same common factors that can lead to disease in separate organ systems that are often treated as though they were independent of each other. And also that the same non-pharmacological interventions, psychological, nutritional, and physical, especially if used in combinations and together with self-care offer the hope of restoring health. Our current biomedical research and patient care efforts today are very much focused on diagnosing and treating disease. Even prevention medicine is mainly about preventing disease, not so much about restoring health. As a consequence, the process by which health can be restored or not is still somewhat mysterious. If we think about COVID and, near, and the nearly 40% of patients who have not regained their health after a documented acute infection, it is obviously very important to understand why these patients with long COVID continue to experience symptoms, but it is also important to understand the process of recovery from COVID. Similarly, in patients who are successful in reversing early diabetes by improving their diet and losing weight, what are the healing processes that take place in restoring normal metabolic function? Much of this remains unknown as, as we know much less about health than we do about disease. And one reason for that is health is complex. It involves the whole person. Over the last century bio, of biomedical research, we have become much better at analysis or breaking things down into component parts than at synthesis or putting parts back together and understanding the whole. However, medicine is beginning to catch up to integrative thinking that is well established in other scientific fields, and this new knowledge may be key to understanding health. We know that living organisms are organized into multi-scale interdependent networks. For example, society can be viewed as a social network where each node represents an individual that when magnified is itself a network where each node represents an organ which is also a network of cells, pathways, and molecules. The web of life consists of networks within networks. So how can this help us understand the process of restoring health? We know that multi-scale networks not only can self-organize, but also have the potential to evolve and grow through the emergence of patterns of higher complexity in response to challenges. Emergence is a very important concept and is divide, defined as the ability of components of a network system to work together to give rise to unexpected new and diverse behaviors that are not present or predictable from its individual components. This can happen from a top down or the bottom up. Examples of bottom up health restoration processes would be immune responses, epi epigenetic changes or microbiome adaptations. These types of processes happen all the time without us being aware of them, but can have a profound effect on health of the whole person. Examples of top-down processes could be changes in behavior or societal changes that would involve conscious decisions on the part of individuals or groups of individuals. And these can also have profound effects on health. The ability to change one's behavior is uniquely human. And this, challenge, and this change was transformative in human evolution from acquiring a sense of time and linear causality to the development of scientific methods that have led to spectacular increase in overall life expectancy worldwide just in the past century due to improvements in sanitation, water purification, food availability, and vaccines. And this is why the concept of whole person health is so important right now. We are at a critical juncture in our evolution of our species and our alarming health outcomes, the COVID pandemic and the global threat of climate change are a call to action to embrace the evolution and thinking that has already occurred in other areas of science. We argue that the concept of whole person health is an important part of a growing awareness and integrative movement that began in the early 20th century with particle physics, astronomy, and the birth of ecology, and gathered steam in the 1970s with systems biology and network science. This way of thinking emphasizes relationships and connections and teaches us that in a system, the whole influences every part and every part influences the whole. This worldview is not new and shares many insights with Eastern philosophies that are foundational to mind and body practices such as meditation, yoga, and acupuncture, as well as traditional cultures from around the world, including Native Americans, 
Native American culture that are rooted in the awareness of the relationship of humans with the natural world. These traditions can teach us a great deal. And one of the things that integrative health research can do is figure out how we can study whole systems. Integrative health is not just putting complementary and conventional medicine together. It's an emergent phenomenon that aims at transforming healthcare through a balance of analysis and synthesis, a focus on health, and an understanding of the fundamental interconnectedness of human life with its environment, both the social determinants of health as well as the physical environment. <clears throat> when fully realized, in integrative health is whole person health, empowering individuals, families, communities, and populations to improve their health in multiple interconnected domains, biological, behavioral, social, and environmental. This type of research is complex and it's going to be a challenge. To help inform our approach, we held a workshop this past September on methodolog methodological approaches for whole person research, specifically to explore the fundamental science of interconnected systems, discuss ways of in investigating multi-component interventions or therapeutic systems, and finally, to investigate ways of examining the impact of multi-component interventions on, multi, on a multi-system or multi-organ outcomes. As I would be describing in our uh, new objectives and strategies, research relevant to whole person health includes basic research on the connections between two or more physiological systems. Um, and this can include, of course, interoception, the connection between the nervous system and other systems of the body, and also other types of connections, such as that between the gut and the musculoskeletal system. Relevant research to whole person health also includes clinical and therapeutic translational studies, looking at the impact of a single therapeutic on multiple physiological systems or the impact of multi-component interventions on single systems. Finally, the ultimate grand challenge would, would be um, studying multiple interventions and their outcomes on multiple systems. All of this integrative research is relevant to whole person health. An important part of the strategy, strategic plan was to take a look at our name, NCCIH, and the meaning of each letter. So we'll start with the letter, the middle C. Here are some illustrative examples of complementary therapies based on primary therapeutic input, nutritional, psychological, or physical, as well as the overlap between these categories and also the overlap with other categories such as drugs and devices. Importantly, one should not look at this diagram as a way to decipher what NCCIH does and does not fund. Rather, this is meant to be used as a framework for situating complementary therapies in an evolving landscape where distinctions between what is complementary and what is conventional is increasingly blurred. The nutritional category includes, includes the diet um, and dietary patterns, including behaviors related to food intake and interventions such as mindful eating, also vitamins and minerals, and essential nutrients such as essential fatty acids. It also includes plants, herbs, and spices, that may be part of someone's diet as well as probiotic and prebiotics. As you can see, the natural product category overlaps only partially with the nutritional category, as this was deliberate in order to represent medicinal plants and other products that would not be consumed as part of one's diet, but would be used for medicinal purposes. For, for example, astrag astragalus or valerian or venoms. This category also includes natural products that would not be ingested and could be inhaled, such as aromatherapy, or used topic, topically, such as CBD. Uh, also notice that we've included dietary supplements as straddling the nutritional and drug category. The same compound, for example, niacin, can be classified as a dietary supplement or a drug, depending on the dose. And finally, the category of botanical drugs includes drugs such as epidiolex that are derived from plants, such as cannabis. What we previously called mind and body practices, we are now calling psychological and or physical as we think these terms are more precise. The psychological category includes interventions such as mindfulness and psychotherapy, 
and interventions that overlap with other categories, such as mindful eating, which overlaps with nutritional, and also a number of interventions that overlap with physical, such as yoga, tai chi, and acupuncture. The letter I for integrative is now defined as advancing research on the integration of complementary and conventional care and integrative approaches to physiology, pathophysiology, and treatment. And the letter H for health includes health promotion and restoration, resilience, disease prevention, and symptom management. This is similar to what we had in the previous strategic plan with an emphasis now on protective and health restoration factors. I wanted to share an overview of our framework for the clinical research that we fund. It's a continuum beginning with basic and mechanistic research, transla translational research that verifies mechanistic findings are relevant in humans, refinement and optimization of the intervention to maximize impact or treatment adherence by individuals, and then efficacy. Does it work under tightly controlled conditions? and effectiveness, does it work in, in real world conditions, in healthcare settings? And here we'll fund a lot of pragmatic clinical trials that are carried out in uh, healthcare systems. Lastly, dissemination and implementation science research to evaluate strategies to facil facilitate the adoption of interventions of demonstrated effectiveness across different healthcare settings. Our funding mechanisms are designed to roughly align with each of these stages of research maturity and I'm happy to share more information on our funding opportunities uh, later. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna talk uh, about our new five-year strategic plan. The first objective here remains similar to our first objective in the previous strategic plan in that it addresses the fundamental building blocks of complementary and integrative science and methods. <clears throat> we remain committed to develop strong methodology for studying natural products especially those delivered as complex mixtures and their effects across multiple biological systems. What has changed quite a bit from the previous strategic plan is that here under strategy number, uh, strategy number two, we've incorporated methods, develop, uh, methods development specifically aimed at testing the reliability and validity of complementary diagnostic and therapeutic systems. And our focus on fundamental science includes developing outcome measures to best quantify health restoration and resilience, as well as methods for developing, uh, uh, for as well as methods development for implementation science and effectiveness research. This is our new objective that really focuses on whole person health, emphasizing basic research into the interaction between distinct physiological systems, clinical and translational research involving multi-component interventions and multiple physiological systems and effectiveness research that looks at incorpor the incorporation of complementary approaches in real world healthcare systems. As we know today, our healthcare system is generally oriented towards disease rather than towards health. Objective three is part of NCCIH's goal to address this bi-directional health disease continuum and support basic and mechanistic research into the restoration of health or the process so-called salutogenesis. This particularly applies to pre-disease states such as pre-diabetes or pre-hypertension when functional or biochemical abnormalities are manifest but still reversible. A priority for NCCIH is increasing the diversity of researchers engaging in complementary and integrative health research and enhancing the participation of individuals from groups that are underrepresented in the biomedical, clinical, behavioral, and social sciences. We seek an improved career pipeline that produces more NCCIH refund, uh, funded trainees, fellows, and early career development awardees who then go on to become successful in competing for subsequent NIH or other federally funded research awards. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, surveys conducted in the United States continue to reveal that many citizens do not have a firm grasp of basic science, facts, and concepts nor do they understand the scientific process. Without an understanding of the science of health, many consumers will continue to value anecdotes over evidence, believe excessive claims made by supplement manufacturers or TV doctors touting the latest miracle cure, and potentially make unwise and unsafe decisions about their health. 
So we continue to build on and expand our efforts to educate the pub public about complementary and integrative interventions um, and the importance of understanding biomedical research so that they can make informed evidence-based decisions about their health. And here I've just uh, included in wrapping up a few um, references. Uh, our research investments in understanding the role of complementary and integrative health approaches in health promotion, restoration, resilience, disease prevention, and symptom management are largely informed by data on complementary products and practices that people are using. These data include what groups of people use them, why they use them, how their use has changed over time, and how their use relates, uh, how their use relates to the health outcomes. So these are just some uh, publications that have come out of our center uh, describing um, who, when, and where, and how uh, people are using complementary integrative health approaches. And with that, I am finished and I will, would like to take questions if there are any. Dr. Murray, we have one question in the chat. Um, it says, in the last strategic plan, the concept of precision medicine was a recurrent theme. Is, that, is it not mentioned in this strategic plan and what happened to it? Oh, um, no, it, it remains to be, it, it remains a priority. Um, I, you know, I, I, I guess I, I don't have an explanation why it's not explicitly um, uh, called out in the new strategic plan, but one, um, one kind of uh, conceptual challenge that we face uh, with complementary integrative health approaches is that if you look at um, the overall effect size in many studies, uh, looking at the mean effect across the entire population um, and the entire sample, the effects can be uh, rather small. But then if you do subgroup analyses, um, very often you'll find a, a subgroup for, for which the effect size is larger um, and more consistent. Um, and then there's a subgroup for which these interventions don't have um, an effect at all. So um, one, one thing we would like, of course, to explore is why does it work for um, certain individuals and not others? And you know, this is, I think, um, getting to that question. So that certainly remains um, at the forefront of um, our thinking. I, I don't have an explanation why it's not explicitly um, stated in the uh, strategic plan. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Uh, that was actually <clears throat> Dr. Dagenhart's question. Dr. Dagenhart, did you wanna elaborate or say anything um, after Dr. Murray's presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to just uh, restate, uh, Dr. Murray, how much we appreciate uh, your presentation today. Um, having read through strategic plans, there's no way I could have come close to, to putting together the, the conciseness of, of your presentation and really highlighting um, what I see is a really dramatic shift in, in, in the ideology um, at NIH. Um, if I can speak historically from an osteopathic perspective, this is, is your framework is exactly what we have been trying to promote for generations and, and, and clearly have often felt isolated, you know, in supporting that. And I think it is amazing that um, that the osteopathic profession should clearly see that there is no isolation whatsoever. We are in, in you know, the mainstream of, of societal and, and science thought in regards to what is necessary to advance patient care and outcomes. The issue is now we got to engage it. So, um, so once again, thank you. I see some other questions coming up, so I will come back in later. Great. I, I guess um, just to uh, re respond to that, that um, um, I, I, I'm not sure I would call it uh, mainstream. I, I hope it becomes mainstream, but, but I think there's just so many person approach. It's complex, right? And so we're, we're reductionist by nature. So we look at assist one system at a time, even the NCCIH's portfolio as it stands right now, um, very few 
uh, studies are looking at uh, multi-component interventions um, and even less are looking at multiple biological systems simultaneously. Part of that is it's just really hard to do that. Um, hopefully with advances in science and advances in methodologies, um, and, you know, we're, we're, if, if one thing that came up with that workshop um, on methodologies for whole person health was, you know, the need for interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think comp it became clear that computational science is going to be a big part of this going forward. Okay, uh, Dr. Murray, we actually have a question from somebody in the um, audience, Dr. Jed Downs, one of our DO Touch members. I'm supposed to talk. I thought I could just write it. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, I had some issues with, okay, so my first question was, does the emphasis on health and salutogenesis translate to medical reimbursement? practices down the road to allow for interventions which might be considered maintenance or is treatment um, still con going to only continue to be reimbursed for treating illness and disease? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, it, it, you know, um, I think uh, I don't need to tell this group that, um, you know, reimbursements are very um, procedural and procedures um, are typically targeted to fixing something that's gone wrong, right? And not maintaining or preventing disease. It's, it's really hard. Um, I don't think that's part of today's care model and, and reimbursement models. Um, I guess what I would say is, is one of the goals of this research would be to um, very clearly and quantitatively define how um, interventions can um, restore health or, or prevent um, disease. And, and so I, I think if, if we do kind of establish that, um, then I think there's a, a better chance that payers will see value in that. But your guess is as good as mine. Okay. I was just wondering how much uh, cross, cross uh, NIH communication and, uh, you know, um, actually, you know, actually takes place. I mean, are you working, are you in your site in a silo or are you, uh, or is this being disseminated systemically throughout, uh, um, you know, the, yeah. the, the federal government? Um, well, um, I guess what I could say is that the, the, this strategic plan is relatively new, it was released just this past May, but, um, we already have, you know, the, for example, the, um, the workshop on whole person health methodologies was co-sponsored by a number of uh, centers across the NIH. Um, there's a number of um, funding opportunities and initiatives um, where we're partnering with other um, centers. So, so there certainly is some more broad um, interest in, in um, this approach. Um, I, I will also say that <clears throat> in, in a lot of our conversations um, in workshops and meetings and seminars, um, they are held jointly with other federal agencies, may, uh, maybe very notably uh, CMS personnel um, who are there and, and they're aware of our approach. And, and um, you know, uh, I guess I, um, we just have to keep that conversation going across the NIH and across important partners such as uh, those at CMS, um, you know, to, to hopefully um, result in some um, benefit down the road. If I could add into Dr. Murray's uh, response. Um, so as clinicians, we got to live in both worlds of, of, of the world of science and, and, and trying to advocate for better patient care based off of our experience as well as both uh, as our collective discussion, uh, but also within um, a socioeconomic system, which at this stage in the game is, is really quite separate from, from the delivery of care. Uh, we do have scheduled in the future or we're working in a future webinar to bring in a, a clinician who has worked into a new reimbursement model, the value-based system, which is going to, I think, 
come closer to what we think is going to allow for preventative medicine, provide more time for more quality care. And, and so that we are going to be addressing that uh, topic again, hopefully in 2022. Um, other questions? Okay, so we have a lot coming in actually. So our next question is directed to both Dr. Murray and Dr. Dagenhart. It's asked, um, wondering how, how you and Dr. Murray see this relating to osteopathic research. I like the concept of studying multimodal interventions and multi-organ systems, but wonder how this would apply to osteopathic medicine. Um, Dr. Murray, if I can take that first, because I'm gonna add more questions for you to address through the discussion. Um, so um, to date, I can say that our practice-based research network has been trying to build an infrastructure for these more system-based research um, uh, um, projects. And, and, and it, they are complicated. And Jane Johnson has is, is been pulling her hair off to help us as clinicians to get um, the uh, tools to help us to do that. Uh, what we've been primarily successful at is, is what I'm seeing that you highlight at the end is primarily kind of more observational work of, you know, who's doing what and, you know, maybe what might be for the work that we're doing cross-sectional observations regarding effectiveness and, and safety. Um, but, you know, when we're looking at these more complicated systems research, at this point in time, I have not seen uh, in NIH, you know, outcomes for that, although that's what you're trying to fund. But clearly it's not easy. And we've applied for uh, NIH grants uh, trying to help build infrastructure. And, and we've run into problems because it's, it's like we're trying to, you're trying to fund things to get to the end, but neither you nor external partners have been able to achieve the end. So I, I'm hoping that that makes some sense and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, you know, this is a paradigm shift for us too. Um, and, you know, if it's a paradigm shift for us, then I think um, e even the rest of the NIH is, is going to be catching up. So, and, and it's, a, it's a challenge, right? Um, we don't know what those um, outcomes are gonna be. Um, and we, we um, I guess the best thing to do is just to have that conversation and hopefully um, reach a sort of consensus of, um, of how we're gonna measure this and um, what, what that's gonna look like in the end, I don't know, but um, I think the important thing right now is that um, it seems like the conversation has, has started, so. And you know, as we go forward and, and we put these mo in more concrete um, questions in the form of funding opportunities and stuff, I think that will really crystallize the community, such as your community, to, to be able to engage um, with us and work, work together with us to find some of those solutions. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Murray. Uh, Dr. Dagenhart, I believe this question is directed mostly towards you. It asks, how will DO Touch be part of contributing to the goals of NCCIH? Well, certainly um, Dr. Murray uh, actually manages uh, some of, of the um, RFAs that, um, that we've been looking at and, and that we have applied for. Uh, we've gotten feedback in regards to our, our applications. Um, um, and so we're constantly looking at how we can partner with NIH. But the big issue is how do we take, uh, you know, our diverse network of practicing clinicians and deal with the issues of diverse, you know, methods that are being applied and data collection procedures, how we can help to standardize that, systematize that into an efficient system so that we can actually deliver, you know, our outcomes associated with our research questions in a manner that's going to meet NIH's uh, requirements. Uh, that it right now is kind of the, the holy grail that we're in search of. Um, and uh, 
I know NIH in the past in this field have often, you know, uh, created, um, you know, advisory boards to help uh, groups uh, build infrastructure um, to, to achieve hopefully the type of research that you are strategizing for. Um, is, is that still an option? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think you're referring to um, when, when we fund a, a program, a, a large program, uh, we, we typically do set up a, an advisory board um, to not approve anything going on with the studies, but just kind of um, be uh, an expert um, voice to inform um, the coordinating center, for example, that is, that is overseeing uh, the number of trials. Um, this, this is definitely um, a model that's pretty typical um, across the NIH. Okay, so we have a couple of live questions. Our first one is from Dr. William Brooks. Thank you, Dr. Murray, for a superb presentation. I agree with Dr. Degenhart that you very succinctly and very elegantly um, condensed over a century of osteopathic thought into a few minutes and, and actually deepened and broadened it. There are a couple things with regard to um, the practical concerns that have been raised that are hopeful signs uh, that I don't think are as well known as they should be. The first is that the Med MCAT exam changed fundamentally a few years ago to include the social sciences. And I think that's a huge step forward compared to uh, previously uh, across both the MD and DO professions that requires uh, a broader consciousness than had been the case. The other thing is that as of last January 1st, uh, the CPT codes now are set up so that billing for evaluation and management services can be exclusively based on time. And that can be abused. So here again, the importance of research is fundamental because as a taxpayer, I don't wanna pay for clinicians sitting around twiddling their thumbs. On the other hand, uh, it does open up opportunities for the kind of one-on-one -on -one care that um, has been frustrated with the previous uh, methods of evaluation and management. My other comment is that um, I'm, a, I'm a clinician in private practice. I've been in and out of academic medicine. And there's a tool that is not directly available to me that all of us taxpayers have paid for, and that's REDCap. And it has, it right now it's limited to non-for-profit organizations. And you might be in a position uh, from a political standpoint to uh, ferment a conversation about that tool being available to uh, a wider audience because uh, uh, it, it, it is just an idea for you to consider that it's limiting right now to um, those practitioners in private practice uh, who might wanna gather meaningful data. And unless they have a formal relationship with a academic medical center, they can't use it. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't know much about um, how those the reasons behind uh, those limitations. And, and I don't know um, how much a, a funding organization um, could influence um, the regulations surrounding that. Um, it's, it's, it's worth asking. And, and so maybe, because um, I agree with you, um, I think um, um, it, it limits the potential of uh, the work that maybe you, you would, um, be engaged in. So, I, you know, thanks for bringing it to my attention. Um, maybe it's uh, worth having a discussion at our center about that. 
Thank you, Dr. Murray. Our next question comes from Dr. Marcucci. Go ahead. I think you're still muted, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. First, uh, thank you, Dr. Peter Murray, for your fantastic presentation. I was uh, very pleasant, um, astonished to what we have now as a powerful uh, tool to implement um, osteopathic research due to your presentation. And my question would be, uh, would you um, support the OTouchNet, the OTouchNet for doing research in um, giving us, us advices what we are missing as clinician, as capital idea to implement um, a therapy or uh, speciality in osteopathic medicine for treating people. Um, if, if I understand, um, I, I can't really speak generally. Um, you know, I, I, I guess the best advice, um, if you're considering submitting a proposal, is to reach out and contact the program officer, such as myself, um, because, you know, we are certainly um, highly informed about the, um, the, you know, the motivations behind the uh, funding opportunities um, and the pitfalls that uh, clinicians and, and researchers can fall into, um, you know, just by reading the funding opportunity. Um, sometimes it's just not clear uh, to the to the applicant um, the do's and don'ts, and and we have resources to to clarify those things. But um, your best resource is definitely to um, well ahead of time. Uh, call up and, and talk to a program officer. Thank you so much for your presentation. I would like add only one comment. Thank you to Dr. Degenhardt for what he presented uh, as information about the future in the osteopathic research. Thank you, Dr. Marcucci. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Degenhardt. Dr. Murray, you, you mentioned a couple of times about the uh, program that this, um, several centers sponsored in the fall regarding whole person research. Is, is, are the proceedings available? Is there a site that uh, people can? Yes. Um, so, yeah, so this was recorded on the, um, and is available on what's called the NIH video cast. Um, I could follow up with you after this meeting and send you the link. Uh, make sure you make sure you have it. Okay, that would be yeah, great. So that's Thank publicly you. available. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Okay, we have a couple of questions just in the chat. Um, the first one being, I understand that CMS is moving towards an outcome-based reimbursement model, which may tie in with NIH. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and then our second question is, uh, <laughs> um, when it comes to science communication, anecdotes often, um, often work better for influencing individuals relative to education and understanding scientific methods. Is science slash health communication part of the emphasis for NCCIH? Yeah, absolutely. We have a whole communications department and, and that was our final um, objective in, in our strategic plan. Um, you know, perhaps we're one of the more um, centers at NIH that are vulnerable to misinformation um, just because of the nature of the interventions that we, we, we are focused on. And so if you go to our website, we have a whole glossary A to Z um, with, you know, in-depth um, information on, on all of the interventions. <clears throat> There's an app that um, summarizes uh, natural products uh, that are, that's available for you know, uh, public use. It's, 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 it's very nifty and very um, informative. But the, you know, of course, these are resources that people have to seek out and you have to be motivated. And so um, 
we do what we can. Um, uh, we're on different social media networks and so on and so forth. And we really do drive that central message of, um, you know, look at look at the science, uh, li listen to the experts, um, verify what you're hearing. Um, and, and we're spreading the word that there is a lot of misinformation out there. So, you know, it, it's, it's a challenge because a lot of these people, I think that are more vulnerable to misinformation um, probably aren't uh, tuning into a lot of the channels that, that um, we're using. Um, I think also, it's um, another challenge is people who are using complementary integrative interventions um, will seek them out based on advice from you know their relatives, their friends, or something they read on on the internet. But then when they go to their doctor, they don't discuss these things with their doctors. Uh, I, you know, so it, it's I think in their mind it's compartmentalized. There's the conventional medicine that the doctor gives me, and then here's the alternative medicine that I'm going to try out. Um, but I think um, if, if a lot more people engage their clinician um, and had a conversation about what they're using and, and what they should be using and, and so on and so forth, um, I think that would go a long way um, for of you know, reaching the people and, and giving the right information to these people. Yeah, thank you so much. Another just excellent response. And I had noticed in the strategic plan, it's the first time I've seen that as a priority in an NIH strategic plan. So clearly this is an example of how the pandemic has increased our awareness of uh, the challenges of, of communication um, to um, people within the healthcare community as well as across society. Um, and, and, and I, I think it's, it's really important that we acknowledge that, you know, science is a process. It's not an end. Some people look at it as it's supposed to be, you know, the end source of all knowledge and what they say is, is the truth forever. And if it's not, then it undermines the credibility of everything. We all need to engage our patients and our communities on that level. So we, we definitely appreciate NIH helping to take that leadership. I will say from previous uh, strategic plans that um, especially the last one, I had never seen it so clearly stated that a purpose of NIH is to be an economic engine uh, to society. And, and, and too often in this current environment, I think people's trust in the scientific system has been compromised because of that um, lack of disclosure, uh, the, the uh, uh, policies that have maybe been generated in science that have actually promoted more, um, you know, uh, um, special interest groups direction uh, versus not. And, and I think we're gonna suffer a while from that and we have to come up with a solution for it as well. So once again, uh, certainly give feedback to, to the center of how much we appreciate um, them recognizing this as something we got to really strategically deal with. Yeah, and another thing uh, you kind of um, touch on a, a, an important point is, you know, NCI, you know, they, they, their, their goal is to treat cancer and so they can, Put out information and they can put out guidance that's scientifically based. Um, but what about, let's say, acupuncture? Who's going to put the information out about acupuncture? Well, it's going to be acupuncture societies, right? Um, it's it's going to be NCCIH, but so there, there's kind of an inherent added challenge there where because it's not disease-based, the proponents for it are going to be those that will benefit from the promotion of, of whatever they're pushing. So it's, it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little bit trickier in that regard. Dr. Murray, this is really great. We have so many questions rolling in as you, as you guys continue to uh, talk. 
So our next question um, is from one of our DOTouch.net members, and it asks, is the same 34% discussed with doctor quotes more uh, in rehab population finding consistent finding consistent with the 1990s findings of Dr. of David Eisenberg and colleagues? So the 34% that you were discussing before. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm can, whoever's not, asking the question, can you remind us, because I'm, I'm also blanking on this, what the 34% is in relation to? Jane, you might have to uh, promote Dr. Robbins. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Robbins. You're muted right now, Hallie. Unmuted, okay, thank you. Um, appreciate this time and opportunity. Uh, great presentation. Um, in the 1990s, there were two articles, I believe 1994 and 1996, in terms of David Eisenberg and colleagues at Harvard finding that approximately one in three people was um, presenting to their doctor, whether it was weight loss programs, acupuncture, massage, or any number of other um, complementary and alternative, as they were then called, um, programs and activities. And just wondering how much more likely are people now open to talk about what they're actually doing versus still um, not necessarily being fully disclosing to their healthcare providers? Um, I don't, well, I, what I can say is that, um, if you look at some of the references, um, that I, that I included at the end there, uh, that talks about, um, a breakdown of who's, who's using what, um, as far as age groups, um, and different socio, um, demographic, uh, categories, um, and, and, and across, uh, ages, um, the, there, there are, um, it's, it's different across the groups, um, but it's increasing. It's been increasing over the years. Um, <clears throat> I really don't know um, as far as kind of, um, you know, offering information to, to their primary care physicians about what they're engaged in. Um, you know, I, I know I did talk about um, that a lot of people don't do that, um, but I, I really don't have an idea of um, what those numbers are. Thank you. Yeah, it's the more that we can encourage and, you know, that's part of fostering the discussions. Um, we're all the better if we know more about our patients. It isn't easy to get that information across and I appreciate how difficult it is when people are searching for their own information instead of relying on sources that we all value. So thanks very much. Yeah, you know, I wonder, should it be part of the medical history uh, questionnaire that they fill out when they come into the office? Um, you know, are, are you taking any of these, are you taking dietary supplements? Are you engaging in mind-body interventions? And just to put it on the map and, and just to, give an opportunity to, to, to have that conversation. Similar you know? to substance use, it's a great thing to just ask and people are much more likely to share if they are asked. And then it's an open conversation, great idea. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. Dr. Murray, we have just one more question uh, just for a really quick answer. Um, what, if any, potential studies is NCCIH planning for long COVID? Oh um, yeah, last year um, we we already released a funding opportunity to um, look at complementary integrative uh, interventions to to test their effectiveness in, in dealing with some of the symptoms of um, um, post acute uh, sequelae. I think it's is the official term. But anyway, um, so those uh, those have been funded. I don't know what exactly was funded, but those studies are ongoing. That's wonderful. Dr. Dagenhart, did you have any final thoughts? I do. Thank you. Um, so 
for those who have been um, uh, actively participating in this program, earlier in the year, we had a, um, a journal club where we um, looked at one of Helene Langevin's, uh, the center director for NCCIH, um, one of her uh, recent publications, which you know clearly was um, insightful and, and complementary to, to the strategic plan that she has helped to shepherd and that Dr. Murray has presented. Uh, she will also be at the Institute's sponsored uh, Interdisciplinary Consortium on Manual Therapies Conference in May. And so we're getting a lot of, of communication and, and, and uh, um, collaboration, at least on a informational side and educational side uh, with this center. And, and this is unprecedented. And I really want to, to highlight the quality of the people that are part of NCCIH right now. Clearly today's presentation indicates just how consistent their frame of reference, their thought processes are to the traditional osteopathic approach. And it is now time that this profession, you know, engages uh, as, as much as it can and overcome some of the barriers that we've been hesitant to overcome in order to take advantage of, of, of this moment. So um, Dr. Murray, thank you so much for the time you put together this presentation. It was phenomenal. It, we will be sharing it throughout our, our um, uh, people uh, in our uh, practice-based research network. There are over 800 in different time zones, so people will be able to watch it at different times. So your impact will continue beyond today. So thanks again for your time. It was a pleasure being here, and and just um, I, I'm just the messenger. This is the director's message, so I'm speaking on her behalf. So anyway, um, it was a pleasure uh, being here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Thank you. Thank you.